Norm, I'm sure that uh, Christine appreciates your having played Redbud. That's the name of a small town just down the road from where, where she lives. Well, thank you both again. Um, Christine, would you say uh, just a few words about um, some of your musical memories of growing up in rural southern Illinois and then how you made a transition into the world of classical singing and opera? All right, I'll try to do this quickly. I actually was born here in Springfield, and uh, yes, and um, is my old violin teacher here? Is Mrs. Stack, Judy, Judy Stack? I learned to play the violin from Judy. Thank you all for coming, Judy and Larry. <laughs> um, but. We came here because my, my dad had a job here, but all of our people are from Alexander County and Jackson County in southern Illinois. Uh, I lived in McClure for a few years and Grand Tower for a few years. I never saw an opera until I was in college. And the first opera I saw was Don Giovanni by Mozart, and I was just blown away by it. Um, but my whole family sang, everybody. If you didn't sing, and one of the reasons that my mom wanted me to play the violin was because she thought I sang out of tune. So <laughs> that was not allowed in our family. Everybody sang. I used to, as a kid, think that it was kind of fun to go to funerals because we would have a wake and we would all sing all night. And my uncles would get out their guitars and their harmonicas and um, that's what we did. I just thought every family was like that. So when I went to school, I studied um, music education and thought that, you know, I would teach singing and violin and guitar lessons. And um, my voice grew later, it, not until my late 20s. And I discovered that I had a voice that could do opera. And so I pursued that and studied with teachers at Washington University in St. Louis. I studied with Birgit Nielsen, who was one of the greatest Wagnerian sopranos of the 20th century. Um, and she's really the one who gave me some good tips about what to do to get my career going. Um, but I've never lost touch with that part of me that, that sang in hoot nannies. We still have a hoot nanny in our backyard every year. And uh, we've done that for about 30 years. And if you've got an instrument, you bring it. We play gut buckets, guitars, whatever you got. And um, I've never lost that part of my, my life. And um, I always say to singers when they say, oh, well, you do crossover stuff really well. I said, I'm crossing over when I sing opera. I, <laughs> I'll just be honest. But um, I think good singing and good playing is good whether you're singing a hymn or you're singing an aria or you're singing a, you know, a show tune or a bluegrass tune. It's all about telling a story. And I think that's what our... What our job is here is to tell a story. Thanks, Christine. Same, uh, same question for you, Noam. Uh, could you tell us a little about your experience of growing up in Skokie and the Chicago area, and then the question of, of how a boy from Skokie gets into banjo playing and bluegrass? Um, so, uh, we, I actually grew up in Chicago until age of eight. Uh, we moved to Skokie, and so I had, I had already started playing banjo um, when I was eight because I became jealous of my brother's hobby of playing the mandolin. Um, he, uh, my brother saw a bluegrass band play at his school as part of a kind of revolving arts program um, where each month they would bring in a different uh, musical act from a different genre or world music, and he saw this bluegrass band, um, the Buck Stove and Range Company, and he saw a mandolin, and he pointed at it, and he wanted to try to take lessons, and his mandolin teacher was the guy in that band. He started studying with that guy whose name was Charlie Brown. All this seems like a fairy tale. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was taking these lessons uh, for a couple years, and while he was taking his mandolin lesson, I was throwing a baseball back and forth with my mom, and. She suggested that uh, I could learn the banjo if I, if I wanted to pick an instrument. And I was fairly nonchalant about it. I said, sure, yeah, I'll play banjo. I, don't, I didn't really know what it was. I just kind of wanted something to, to play. And my, I think my folks thought um, that my brother and I would, would share tunes with each other if we played um, you know, banjo and mandolin as opposed to like mandolin and tuba. But that would have, 
That would have been interesting as well. So I, I kind of stumbled into to banjo, um, and I wasn't a prodigy. It was just it was a hobby and a passion, and I think I really fell in love with the the culture uh, around the music as much as the music. Um, the the you know common question is like banjo. You why banjo? You're from Chicago. Um, by 1988 or 1989, um, when I started learning, um, the bluegrass instruments had kind of made their way into the cities. Like after the the folk revival or folk scare of the 60s, um, <laughs> a lot of people in college towns and in metropolitan areas kind of followed this trail of breadcrumbs to to the real authentic roots music. And so there were bands playing bluegrass in Chicago, one national band called the Special Consensus. Um, so there were, there were no shortage of opportunities to learn um, banjo in, in Chicago. You know, the Old Town School of Folk Music is an amazing institution in Chicago, but to, to get a real taste of it meant leaving the suburbs, leaving the north side, oftentimes um, coming to central Illinois or the northwest suburbs of Illinois or going to Indiana. Um, I would go to festivals and jam sessions. The first festival I went to was in Decatur, it, I don't know if it's still there. There was a Holiday Inn with this thing called the Holodome. And this bluegrass festival would take over the entire hotel and people would be playing music all night. And I was, you know, 10 years old and coming from Skokie and saw this thing and it was like the greatest party I could ever imagine. And all of a sudden, I was meeting these people from all over the state, all over the Midwest, um, and making new friends um, of people who were my age, but also people who were my parents' age or my grandparents' age, and it just felt like I have like have this exotic hobby. Like it, it felt like uh, this ticket. Like I said earlier, like my friends are getting together on weekends and playing video games or kicking a soccer ball around, and I'm going to get to do this. Like this is the life I want, and so I kind of stuck with it and kept playing, and eventually, kind of you know opportunities presented themselves to play professionally. Thanks. Christina, as, as someone from the rural Midwest, um, what, uh, what does it mean to you uh, to be able to perform with world-class opera companies and orchestras in New York or Munich or Amsterdam? Uh, how do you relate to the people you encounter there? And then on the other side of the coin, um, how are you still involved with, uh, with culture in Southern Illinois? It all, it happens so quickly for me and I always uh, felt like I was sort of an imposter. You know, my degree was in music education. I didn't go to a conservatory. Um, and so I was always afraid when I was early starting out, you know, singing that somebody was going to come to New York City Opera and come backstage and say, you don't have a degree in voice performance. You don't, you know, you, you, you didn't take any classes on acting or putting on makeup or, you know, you, you're out of here. I've always felt like I was not quite in the group, you know. Um, but as I became more um, used to it and got um, opportunities to sing with some of the most amazing conductors in the world and um, to sing all around the world, I've, I've embraced that, and I, I never take it for granted. I, there are times I have to pinch myself to say, oh my gosh, am I singing at the Royal Opera in London, and they've re just reopened, and they asked me to sing with Placido Domingo for this concert? I mean, when my managers called, I thought that was a joke, really. Um, but they said, and, and you're going to get to meet the Queen afterwards, but there's a lot of protocol involved. And they always talk to me like I was a hillbilly, you know, and I don't know why, but uh, they gave me all of these rules, you know, about now you, uh, you do not speak to her till she speaks first and, um, and, and uh, you know, and then be very respectful. And, and I said, okay, when do I get to hug her? When would that, <laughs> I thought they were going to lose their minds, you know, uh, but anyway, I never took those, those opportunities for granted. And so um, when I taught school, K through 12, in Marissa, Illinois, uh, I became friends with a couple of the teachers there. And 
on my travels, sometimes I send out these travel logs to my friends, and one of them is a teacher, Nancy Wagner, who, who t t taught at um, Marissa. And she said to me one uh, time, do you know, we do this program in my sixth grade class, sort of like where in the world is, um, oh shoot, Carmen, I started saying Carmen Miranda, I know that's not right. <laughs> Carmen San Diego. And, um, and she said, I thought, well my gosh, I've got a friend who travels all over the world, maybe we could do this, we had a map of the world up and we'll just put little, you know, okay, she's in Kuala Lumpur, she's in London, she's in Tokyo, whatever, you know. I said, well, could I actually come and talk to the kids? That would be kind of fun. So we started the program, sort of baby steps, and I would go about, I don't know, two or three times a year and talk to the kids. And then I got permission from the St. Louis Symphony to bring them to see a closed rehearsal whenever I was singing something with the symphony. And that's what we would study. Now, these were not music students. It wasn't music class. It was a regular classroom class. And my husband had the idea. He said, let's buy about six or seven clocks. And he said, you know how hotels will have the time in London and the time in, you know, Chicago or whatever. We'll just put, we'll, where, whatever cities you're in, we'll put that underneath the clock and they can have it set so the kids know what time it is where you are. And the, the program started growing. I would bring friends of mine from the St. Louis Symphony to play for the kids. I want to just share one short story about how this was so moving for me. And I, 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 my husband, Ross, who's up there, he would say, I can tell when you've been to Marissa because you always come home and you're just buzzing. You're just so high and so happy. But we were doing in St. Louis, with the St. Louis Symphony, we were doing um, a piece by Benjamin Britten called the, the War Requiem. Have any of you heard that piece? I, I, it's probably one of my favorite pieces ever. Um, Benjamin Britten was from England. He was a pacifist. He wrote this piece and he scored it for a, a full orchestra, for a chamber orchestra, for a children's choir, and a, an adult choir, one soprano and a tenor and a baritone. And um, I sang all the, the Latin mass part of it. Uh, and so I always stand up with the choir. And the two men were soldiers in the war, in World War I. And, um, some of their music just, I, I, it's hard to talk about it, it makes me cry, it's so touching. The poems were written by a World War I um, uh, soldier. Um, and I always would go and talk to the kids right before they came to the rehearsal, just to give them the protocol about, you know, don't applaud, it's a rehearsal, we may stop and, you know, just be very respectful. And about 60 kids would come. And then they, they one day I got there and one kid goes, oh, we've got a list of questions for you, Miss Brewer. I said, okay. And um, these two boys were sitting right in the front, and one of them said, you know this war requiem piece, and their teacher had played a recording I had done of it in London. She would play one movement a day during their study period. And he said, that, that one song in the middle of that, that's not the real story. It's not what the Bible says. And it's a story of Abraham and Isaac. And he said, you know, in the Bible, he does not kill his son, Isaac. But in this piece, he kills his son, he said, we just wanted to know what you, what you think about that. And I said, well, what do you think about why the poet chose, the soldier to, chose to write this? And, and they discussed this in the lunchroom. This is what cracked me up. I looked over at the teacher and she was looking at me like, you know, this wasn't something they discussed in class, you know. And one of them said, well, you know what we think it is? We think that Abraham is supposed to be the old men who start the wars. And Isaac is supposed to be the young men who are getting killed in these wars. I thought, well, you know what, boys and girls, you all get this. And I got a lot of times people would say to me, well, why are you studying something like that with sixth graders? They're not going to understand Benjamin Britten's War Requiem. And I say, the kids get it. A lot of times they get it better than the adults do. And I think it's important for us to share our artistry with young people in small communities, and I would tell them, you know, you all live in a small town, I lived in a small town. You can have dreams, you can try and do something else. You don't, you don't have to feel limited. And um, I hear from some of those kids sometimes, they, they have my email address so they can write me questions, and, and it's really great. But I get so much joy out of it, I think sometimes I get more out of it than the kids do. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. Oh, and it's called Opera Dash Tunities. The kids in the first class thought of that. Opera Tunities is what they call it. Yeah. So.
That's, that's outstanding. Um, Noam, what, what does it mean to you when you get to perform at a place like uh, the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville or festivals in the Ozarks or Appalachia uh, as someone who grew up uh, in the northern suburbs of Chicago? And then conversely, are, are you, uh, do you maintain any sort of connection, musical or otherwise, with the Chicago area? Yeah. Um, well, I, I still you know, play in Chicago and the surrounding areas um, fairly often, several times a year. And, and um, some of the, the musicians that, I've, that I first really played with um, when I was a kid have also moved down to Nashville and are playing professionally. And, so I keep in touch with those people. So there's this um, this link. Uh, the people I've, I've known the longest who I still am in touch with are, are all musicians. And I think there's, I, I just still get a rise to, to get to see the world and to meet people um, from that have had different experiences and different perspectives um, than I have had. Uh, I think you know, getting to play at the Ryman um, in Nashville, where, you know, the, to stand on the same stage that kind of Earl Scruggs sta stood up there and, and played Bluegrass Breakdown with Bill Monroe, and essentially the sound of, of bluegrass was, was crystallized. Like, that's um, an honor of a lifetime. It's a surreal experience, and like, you have to do your best to not let that, you know, sabotage your show if you really think of the. <laughs> how profound it is to get to, to stay, stand on that same stage. But I, I think it's, it's always been, I, I think, finding like a, a, a rich experience in places that I wouldn't have been if it wasn't for the music has been something I've always um, really cherished. Uh, I don't think I would have ever found myself at the, in these communities and making friends um, with a lot of these people, if it wasn't for for the banjo and if it wasn't for music, I, um, you know, my family's Jewish. You probably could figure it out from from my my name. But when I first started playing in a in a band, I was 14, and a lot of times, like the entire weekend would be spent driving around Illinois and Indiana, um, going to these festivals, I was playing in a band called Laura Abair and the Hoosier Prairie Band, and we were all under 16. And we, it was like your classic kind of childhood bluegrass band. We were all wearing matching uniforms, including vests that we were given. And we, we knew that we were gonna have the, our names on the lapel of the vest, um, on, the, on the breast of the vest. When we got the vest, I looked at it, and I was confused, and the, the father of the fiddle player said, hey, he gave me a, an incredible deal on the embroidery. So not only did it say Noam Pekelny, it said Noam Pekelny, and then underneath it said banjo, comma, backup vocals. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, read, it read like a liner notes. Um, and so it's this amazing experience, but the one of, I'll, I'll never forget like the, the one of the very first festivals I played on stage was like hired to play at. It was a Saturday afternoon festival, and it was in Porter County, Indiana. And this was before um, the days of, of email or texting, and so we would correspond via letter with with our, my bandmates, um, and we we were booked at the Porter County. Uh, Park Festival, as far as we knew, and my dad uh, likes to go to, to Temple on Saturday mornings, and the plan was to go, um, I would go to Temple with my dad, with my banjo, um, and then we would just hightail it for Porter County, Indiana, to play at the Park Festival, and this was like our first, my first gig with them, and this was an exotic experience for my dad as well, um, like he didn't come from a bluegrass uh, background, he's from Chicago. And so we left the synagogue and drove to this festival and we pulled up at it and there was a huge sign that said the Porter County Pork Festival. <laughs> and <laughs> I think my dad had this realization of like, what did we just get involved with? Like, what is my son doing? And to this day, I, I, I like to think that that's the only time Anybody or any car has gone straight from a temple to a pork festival. 
in the, in the history of the world. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I, these, the, these people were great friends. I was probably the first Jewish person that they ever actually had an encounter with. Um, they were from a completely different uh, walk of life, completely different socioeconomic uh, background. My friend Tim, the first time he told me that uh, he lived in a trailer, I started laughing because like my, I, I couldn't believe that he was being serious. Like my conception of what life was like is like, no, this isn't the type of person who would live in a mobile home. He's joking and he had to like stop me from laughing and he said like, no, like, we, we live in a trailer. I was like, oh, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I was like nine years old. And like, and so it just like, it made me change the way I think about the world, the way I would perceive or um, prejudge somebody. And so I, I cherish those experiences. And I still think to this day, like a bluegrass festival is an amazing um, experience where you still have people coming from, uh, you know, different backgrounds and people who would probably not agree on anything else. Like if they started talking, if people at a bluegrass festival started talking politics right now, they'd, they'd probably, you know, have some serious disagreements um, and fold up their lawn chairs and go home. But th it's like this music is still uh, an arena where people can go and just put all that aside and celebrate and commune with each other and respect each other. Like, I think that's really important. And when kids start doing that at a young age, then they, they you know, you just, dis, you dispel any notion of these people who live in that county or in that state or who live in the homes like that are the other. Like, it just becomes, you become part of the same community, which I think is really crucial. Well, you've both, uh, you've both already begun to answer this last question, but my, my last question is that is for those of us who, are, uh, who aspire to try to improve urban-rural relations here in Illinois, which could probably use a little work, um, uh, what, uh, what insights can you offer as, as people who have... Um, you know, who grew up in one kind of setting, but whose careers have brought you into contact with the, with the other kind of setting? Well, I, I think um, what Noam just said, that we, we learn that we're not all the same. And, and so often we're talking about the other. Oh, well, they do it this way, or they, they dress that way, or they worship this way. And I, I really do find music is the universal language because no matter what country you're in, um, you know, you look at a score, you look at the music, we read the same notes, we play the same notes. And the more we can incorporate that in our everyday lives, um, then there aren't, there aren't any others. We're all the same. I say this to my little five-year-old grandson all the time, we're all God's children. And um, we're all special. We all have things we can bring to the table. And I love the fact that you said, you know, you're playing for people that, you know, maybe politically would not agree on certain things, but that's okay. And it's okay for us to commune with each other and share music. And I think that's, that's what I think makes the world go round. I think that's why, you know, we can, we can talk peacefully about things that we maybe don't agree on. But when we get to the music, well, then we're making music together. So it's all good. Thank you. Um, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I think, you know, I, I've come to this from as a musician and as someone who travels playing festivals and can see the um, impact of how these events bring people together. I, I remember reading uh, a quote a few years ago where someone was trying to justify um, the decline in actual wages um, for you know most of this country, and they were trying to defend it, saying like, "Yeah, people aren't making as much as as, as they were back in the day, but look at the." 
incredible options everybody has at their fingertips. You could stay at home and watch a movie, you could play a video game on your phone, as if the digital experience that we have right now can, can compensate for <laughs> like a, an actual lack of a living wage or, or lower wages, um, not you know, rising wages. And I thought that was like the most ridiculous argument ever. And I, I mentioned that because I think like we, our civilization <laughs> like depends on people putting their phones down and getting off of their computers, not to demonize these devices because they're amazing and they can connect us. But um, the experience of going to a festival or a concert or a play or a conversation like this versus um, like it's it's crucial, and I think people are maybe um, more reticent to do that when you all of a sudden you can download a movie um, and watch it in high definition at home, or you just want to scroll through your Facebook feed all all evening, and all of a sudden your weekend your weekend is gone. And I think when these these events happen when there is um, a real allure to programming at festivals, series, you know, anything that's going to get people out, I think it's, it's crucial. That's why I think, like, funding for arts programs and festivals, funding for arts in the schools, like, kids are going to be more interested in, in going to music festivals or plays if they are actually involved in the arts themselves. Um, if, if a student is having to make a choice between um, taking shop class and playing an orchestra, like, I hear of, like, the, the options are dwindling, like, it's one or the other, that it's this kind of binary system where it used to be you could have all these different art interests, or I, I, I just think it's, it's important to get kids involved early, and when you, when you can go to these events with, um, with kids, they're not... They're, they're just having a blast and making these connections and feeling like they're part of a community. Um, I also think there's like definitely um, a responsibility of <clears throat> like arts presenters, festival promoters to have, to present diverse lineups at festivals. Like it's like, I think it's crucial to um, not only have bands of, of white men playing at bluegrass festival when there are um, female bands and there are bands of color, the L LGBTQ bands that are out there now. Like, I think we need to embrace these things so everybody feels like that there's a home that they can go and feel welcome. And that's, that's one positive development I've been seeing in the bluegrass community. I think like in this International Bluegrass Music Association has been really trying to kind of um, broaden the, the scope of quote unquote bluegrass and kind of have a, a wide tent kind of philosophy. Well, thank you both very, very much. It was really, really fantastic and such a privilege to talk with you. If you all have wondered what uh, a duet between a Wagnerian soprano and a, a progressive bluegrass banjoist might sound like, uh, now's your chance.